Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to worship from Trinity Mans. And whether you are tuning in locally uh, from Dalry or whether you are tuning in from further afield, you're most warmly welcome as we close this Lord's Day with an act of worship. Let me just tediously trouble you with a couple of uh, intimations. Um, folk local to Dalry will know that we had plans to allow a few extra folks to attend on Sunday mornings from the, the 3rd of January, because although our capacity is only 24, we have some spaces, but we're going to delay that um, because of the most recent restrictions and we'll start taking bookings for the 17th of January. Um, at least that's the plan at the moment. Many thanks to those of you who gave gifts to which were uh, to be distributed amongst vulnerable children uh, through the local social work department. Um, a whole carload uh, of gifts were taken off to Colburnie uh, by Helen Scott. So, but thanks to you all, thanks to Helen for filling her car absolutely full with all these parcels. And then finally, Christmas services. There will be streamed services on this Facebook page. On Christmas Eve, uh, St Margaret's are going to have a service from half past five, which you can view on their Facebook page. Uh, we'll have our usual service, if you like, at half past six, which will be the Festival of Lessons and Carols. But of course, it's been recorded beforehand with various people contributing readings and there's also music and carols in between. So tune in at half past six on this Facebook page. And uh, on Christmas Day, um, if things had been normal, we would have been having a joint service in St Margaret's on Christmas Day. But uh, for uh, this Christmas Day, David Albon and myself recorded a, servo, a service in St Margaret's and that will go live both on the Trinity Church Facebook page and the St Margaret's Facebook page at 10.30am. And um, of course you can watch these at a later time. They'll be stored on respective Facebook pages. So that's this week, that's uh, Christmas. So do catch those services, I'm sure uh, you'll find them a blessing. Isaiah chapter 4 is a portrayal of redemption and also the safety of the Lord's people. And uh, the safety of the Lord's people is really a theme in Revelation 7. Let me read from Isaiah. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honour of the survivors of Israel. Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assembly the cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and the rain. Let's bow together in prayer, shall we? Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we humbly bow in your presence this evening, offering to you the allegiance and the adoration of our hearts, doing so amidst so much trouble and chaos in our world and even in our lives. As we face a festive season which for many people is full of disappointment. We thank you that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ one who offers full satisfaction, however dark our circumstances may be. This evening we confess to you our instinct to make idols Idols out of the things and the pleasures of this world. 
And we all too easily live self-centred lives, shutting you out, shutting other people out, so that even our very best actions are often stained like filthy rags. But we thank you that in your goodness you stoop down to save in Christ Jesus and make us new as we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we see that you intend to do us good and bring us into eternal glory and blessedness by his death and resurrection. Our gracious God, we thank you for the, the presence and the work of your Holy Spirit for his passion to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you through your word. He does this in our hearts. And we ask that as we turn afresh to its truth this evening, that all our minds might be directed to your wisdom, that all our hearts might be full of faith and of love, that we might receive the good things you give to us. And grant, we pray, that we may still sense the presence of heaven breaking through into earth and eternity breaking through into time as we meditate together on your sacred word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me read from Revelation chapter 7. Um, and thank you to Luke Boric for reading so finely and posting that reading or having that reading posted on the church Facebook page to allow us to prepare for this evening. Revelation 7 verse 1. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called out with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. And so it goes through all 12 tribes. And in verse 9, after this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing round the throne, and round the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. 
but the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Now, <clears throat> the book of Revelation, or in the book of Revelation, John is acting like a guide in an art gallery, pointing out various pictures and images. And he's inviting us to look at these various images and allow them to make an impression on us that we might be impressed and affected by this portrayal of God and the outworking of his purposes. Let me try and illustrate that. Earlier this year in January, Lorna and I went on a trip to India. And one of the places we went to visit was, of course, the Taj Mahal. I had seen the Taj Mahal about 20 years ago and thought at the time I'd love to bring Lorna here. And so that particular plan, 20 years in the making, came to pass in January. Now, the Taj Mahal, of course, is an iconic building. It's like no other. And nothing really prepares you for seeing it. It has an astonishing impact on you as, as you see it. Now, something I prepared there. This is a picture I took when we were there. But, you know, it doesn't entirely do it justice. And it's simply a way of remembering um, what it looked like. You see, when you... When you approach uh, the Taj Mahal, you pass through the, the main gateway, the Darwaza, and you go into kind of darkness, and then there's an arch, and your first glimpse of the Taj Mahal is of this extraordinary building framed in an arch, and it truly leaves an amazing impression on you. It has an, a magnetic appeal uh, in, in, in its white marble beauty and its uh, near perfect symmetry. And uh, typically you see it against the, 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 the ocean blue background of a clear sky. And, and when you see this, it's very hard to articulate um, the impact it has on you. And, and you, you, you know that's happening to everyone because you hear people saying, wow, look at that. It, it's, a, it's a kind of difficult to articulate impact this has on you, but you're impacted emotionally, uh, you're, you're impacted visually, uh, aesthetically. It, it, it's, it's lasting. And, uh, of course, when you hear the story that it was built out of love, then that kind of adds to the whole texture of the experience. Now, that is what John is doing as he presents us with these pictures in the book of Revelation. They're meant to leave us with a deep impression of God and his character and the wondrous unfolding of his purposes and of his love and care for his people and their glorious destiny in Christ. You see, this is a, this is a book which isn't so much teaching us propositions of Christian doctrine, the way I suppose you might say the book of Romans is, but rather it's a book which simply uses words to paint pictures. And so for that reason, the, the dominant verb isn't I heard, the dominant verb is I saw. Now, here's the point I'm leading up to. Um, if you fail to see the pictures and allow the broad sweep of these pictures to impact on you, then you miss the point. And, and you know, the most common way of people missing the point of the book of Revelation and missing out on the blessing of, of, of being impressed by who God is and what he has done and the assurance he gives us 
the way to miss out is is to get lost in detail. Um, you would you would think I had rather miss something if I walked into the main gateway towards the Taj Mahal, the, the Darwal, and, and and said, "Look, folk, look, see that brick in the archway." Let's spend hours talking about that brick in the archway and miss the Taj Mahal and the, the glorious impression its beauty can have on you. You would not, but that's what we often do with the book of Revelation. When we read a chapter like chapter 7, we think, right, the only thing I'm interested in is 144,000. Forget everything else. Let's debate that. You're missing the big picture. And, and when you see the big picture, only then do the details begin to fall into place. Let me remind you of the picture so far. Uh, the, the central message of chapters 4 and 5 is that God is sovereignly working his purposes out. However perplexing and mysterious the events are surrounding my life and your life in the world today, However confusing the circumstances, there's a message for me and a message for you in these chapters that God is unfolding his purposes. He is meaning us good. And he's unfolding his purposes in our lives and in history. Chapter 4 is John's great vision of God, the creator, at the centre of the universe, his throne at the heart of all things. Everything else revolves around him. Chapter 5 presents us with God, the redeemer, the son, the lamb. And the scrolls are a picture of the unfolding events on earth and the outworking of the great plan of salvation. And there's a picture here of how at the heart of the unfolding of that plan is the lamb who was slain, the death of Christ. God's purposes unfold on the basis and because of the death of Jesus. He is the key to redemption. He's the key to history. He is the only one who could break open the seals of God's purposes unfolding. And, and that the Lamb secures that victory and, and he opens those redemptive purposes. And the overwhelming purpose, the overwhelming message again is that whatever perplexing is going on in my life, however perplexing the trials of life, God is working his purposes out. We're not subject to lottery-like chance. There's no such thing in the believer's life as luck. But rather, we are under the good, sovereign, gracious hand of God. A loving Father who shows his love that he sent his son, the Lamb, to die for us and secure this wondrous redemption. So chapter 6 opens with the breaking of the seal that the Lamb alone can break open. And what we find unfolding is a scene of horsemen, the horsemen of the apocalypse, setting forth God's judgment in the world. But they describe the, the context in which the church exists in the world. It's a world of war. It's a world of strife, it's a world of want, it's a world of disease like coronavirus. And then it moves on to the martyrs, the fifth seal, asking how long will the people of God suffer? And the answer is given with the sixth seal. It will not last forever, but final judgment is coming. And all wrongs will be righted and all injustice will be dealt with. And now we're in chapter seven. And it stands in relation to chapter 6 because chapter 6 ends with the question, who can stand? You know, in, in, in the light of this vision of final judgment, who can stand? And chapter 7 answers the question, who can stand? By saying, well, God's people can stand. The servants of the Lord can stand because they are under the protection of the very Lamb whose wrath is being unfolded in judgment. And these servants are not only protected, but they're favoured with reward. They, they don't just survive, but they're blessed and rewarded. That's what this chapter is all about. So the first eight verses are really, you could say, the divine sealing and protection of, of the church militant on earth. And from chapter 9, 
the, the blessings that are for the church triumphant in heaven. Let's take each of these two headings. First of all, verses 1 to 8, the protective sealing of the church on earth, what sometimes called the church militant. And the chapter opens with an image of four angels holding back four winds. What's that all about? Well, as is often the case, the, the key to understanding the imagery and the language in Revelation is to read the Old Testament. And, and there you find the number four appears several times. It's, it's, it's often used of um, comprehensive universality. You know, you and I use number four like that. We speak of the four points of the compass. And the four angels are depicted here holding back four winds. Now, when you look at the Old Testament and you look at the prophecy of Zechariah, which particularly informs this imagery, um, you find that the winds seem to be just another way of describing the, f the four horsemen. Uh, let me read uh, from Zechariah chapter 6. The angel answered and said to me, these are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes towards the north country. The white ones go after them. The dappled ones go towards the south country. There's a, there's a, a bringing together of horsemen and winds. And that does seem to be a clue to help us understand what we have in Revelation 7. And uh, it's, it's a different image of the same thing. In chapter 6, a troubled world was depicted using the language of these horsemen and what they brought. In chapter 7, it's the same troubled world depicted by four winds. But the interesting thing in chapter 7 is that for the sake of God's people, those winds are being restrained. Winds which appear, you know, wind doesn't usually... Uh, you know, lend itself to being restrained. And that's what's so wonderful about this picture. That which seems beyond restriction is nonetheless being held back and restrained for the sake of the servants of God, the people of God, who have yet to be sealed. So what does that mean? What does sealing of believers mean? Well, actually in one sense, this idea, like so many goes back to that pivotal moment in Old Testament history um, in Exodus with the Passover. Do you remember the story? You know, the angel of death was going to come in that final plague in Egypt. And the, the Hebrews were told, take a lamb, sacrifice the lamb, take the blood and paint it in your doorposts and the lintels and then you will be sealed protected marked by that blood so that when judgment comes you'll be passed over now the interesting thing is that the people of God were not removed from the horrors of that night in Egypt they were not given a pass that said, your life is going to be easy, you're not going to see or hear or witness any of this. No. Rather, they were to live through it, but in the midst of it, given protection. They were sealed, marked. Um, in ancient times, slaves would be marked by their owners, and therefore they come under the jurisdiction and, and the protective oversight of their masters. Well... God's people, referred to here as the servants of the Lord, are marked as belonging to God, sealed and therefore protected. However difficult things are in life, there is a, there is a protection upon the people of God. Now that's picked up again and developed in the New Testament. I wonder if you can take this to the next step and recognise how the New Testament talks about our sealing. It is, of course... In the Holy Spirit. We, we receive Christ, we trust in him. Every believer without exception receives the Holy Spirit and it's sealed and marked by him 
Corinthians chapter 1. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Ephesians chapter 1. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And finally, Ephesians 4. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. It's the Holy Spirit who seals God's people even through all the suffering and trials of their lives. Having hopefully painted that picture for you, let me move on and ask the question, uh, about those who are being sealed from the sealing itself to those who are being sealed and to the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Now an awful lot of ink has been spilled about this, not all of it very helpful and not all of it very biblical either. But remember, fundamental lesson, you compare scripture with scripture. And when you read that list of 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, you realise that that this number, 144,012 from the 12 tribes multiplied by 1,000, it just represents completeness. It's a picture of the complete people of God. And as in verse 9, John goes on to then speak of an uncountable multitude of God's people, people it's evident that these are the same things. And so the 144,000 is not there to indicate a limitation. It's surely there to indicate that there's a numbering there, which means, if you like, no one's going to be missed out. No one's going to be neglected. But just so that you don't think this 144,000 means there's, there's, there's some kind of crass limit which can't be breached, the image goes on to describe that same multitude as uncountable. What it's saying is that this vast number of God's people, which is uncountable, is nonetheless, we can be sure, no one's going to be missing. No one is left out. Remember, the theme of this chapter is very much the security of God's people in Christ. It's interesting, isn't it, that the, the list of tribes begins here with Judah. Kind of reminds us, doesn't it? that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. You remember the original prophecy um, in Genesis, um, from the Genesis 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. You know, the, the preeminence of the tribe of Judah which seems unusual in this list, nonetheless seems to reflect the preeminence of Christ who draws a multitude of the saved. But the reassurance here, the big picture, is that the number who are sealed and therefore protected is such that there'll be no mistakes. There'll be no erroneous omissions there, just as there'll be no invalid additions. God has sealed up his people whenever tribulations they face. Our eternal well-being is secure with him. And there's a word of reassurance for God's pressurised people. The sealing, the protection of the church on earth. Ultimately, they're secure in Christ. And then from verse 9, John lifts his eyes from the, the church on earth and its divine sealing to the church in heaven and, and the, the divine blessings. He sees a great multitude and they're before the throne and before the Lamb and, and he's, he's seeing into heaven. Uh, not only will the people of God be protected, but they will, they will be rewarded. And, and there is encouragement here. This is a vast multitude. We're so often thinking of ourselves, perhaps particularly in our land, as just a kind of insignificant minority, marginalised in society. 
And yet there's a picture here of a vast number of believers. And these are those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 14, they have turned to Christ, they have trusted in him for salvation and their sins have been washed away. Now, interestingly, something interesting happens in verse 13. An elder steps into the vision and comes alongside John. And, and, and John's no, no longer a spectator. He's not a participant because the elder asks him if he knows what he's seeing. Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And perhaps very wisely, uh, John responds, uh, Sir, you know. And it's then explained that these who are seen by John in, in this great multitude are those who have come out of the great tribulation. He said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I don't suppose John could ever have realised how much controversy would be caused by that one word, tribulation. And here's the question that is often asked. When is this tribulation? When is it? It's a phrase that's taken from the book of Daniel, uh, referring to the turmoil, the great tribulation of the end times. Uh, it it characterises those end times. So when is the end times is the same question. Well, you surely know, don't you? Throughout the New Testament, the language of end times is not some distant future epoch which we can say, ah, well, that's still to come, that's irrelevant to me. No, biblical language is such that the end times refers to the period between the first advent and the second advent of Christ because the prophecy of Joel, quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost, speaking of the coming of the Spirit, speaks of how the Holy Spirit will come in the end times. Besides, Jesus warned the disciples, you remember in the upper room, in this world you will have tribulation. Now he was speaking to the disciples, he wasn't speaking about generations yet to come, he was saying to them, in this world you will have tribulation. Now notwithstanding the fact that there may be a more focused tribulation preceding the coming of Christ, the time in which you and I are living now is precisely the time of tribulation. Believers will know tribulation. Believers in our own land know what it's like to be discriminated against, misunderstood, misrepresented. Or listen to these recent headlines. Jihadists behead more than 50 in football pitch massacre in Mozambique. Many of them were believers. Uh, Leo Christians detained for violating traditional funeral customs. Evidently they were arranging a Christian funeral. Christians want to leave their faith or face consequences before around 16 of their homes were raised by extremists in India's Chhattisgarh region. Now that's 2020, the last couple of months. Point is that tribulation is something that Jesus warned us about now. It's an ever-present reality that characterises the time between the first and second comings of Christ. It's something the church experiences. The danger is that we think, well, all of this is yet to come, and we essentially make the teaching of the Word of God irrelevant because it doesn't really apply to me or to people today. Scriptures make clear this is, has an application for now. We live in the age of the Spirit. We live in that time span between the first and second comings of Christ, during which time we must be ready for his return, but face what he warned us we would have to face. And the wonderful thing is that despite this tribulation, there's great reassurance. The people of God have this to look forward to. There's a depiction here of, of them having a sight of the Lamb. And that, that's so important to, to look forward to. You know, yet in this life, we glimpse the Lord Jesus. 
we perhaps glimpse him in the lives of others who've been transformed by him. We we find him in his word, surely we do. And as we as we share the sacraments, all of these, yes. But this is a depiction of seeing him face to face. And there'll be nothing to obstruct our eye aligned to Christ. And then there will be perfect worship. Verses 15 to 17. They are before the throne of God. Serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You will have heard the echoes there of Psalm 121. And, and a de depiction of a place where there's no hunger or thirst or sunstroke. In other words, all the ills of life have been removed. And here's the reassurance. Whatever pains of tribulation there is on earth, they are not the last word. We will be free of them in heaven. And, and you know, there, there, there's more here. Christ is at the centre in this vision. He will be the fulfilling of our longings and desires. Whatever we longed for in life will be fulfilled in him. He will be the one who alone, when we look to him, will fulfill our longings. Not only will we survive to heaven, but there will be reward in heaven is, is the message here. It's not enough that we simply persevere through tribulation and come safely to eternity, but when we do, there will be untold blessing. And this is the ultimate destiny for God's suffering people, and it's expanded upon later in the book. The sealing of the church militant, the blessings of the church triumphant. In closing, two things. One, how can I be sure of this? Simple answer, end of verse 14, ensure your robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Heaven is not attained by our own effort. It is received by receiving forgiveness in Jesus Christ by his death on the cross. I can't wash my own sin away. He will wash it away for us. He entered into our humanity in order to do that. And secondly, don't miss the wonderful picture of worship that is at the centre of this. Where the Lamb will be in full view of our unobstructed view. I mentioned this morning, when we were thinking about the shepherds and the Christmas story, that there was obviously a change in their lives. And the thing that signalled that change was not simply their readiness to hear the message and respond to it by going looking for Jesus, which is important. But we are then told something they did that was key. They worshipped. They worshipped. If, if you like, the template for God's transformation of human lives always leads a hunger and a desire and an appetite for worship and worship is at the heart of this image seals one to four from last week showed us a world of suffering as the horsemen were unleashed seal five reminded us that god's people will be caught up in this and suffer but it will only last until the end the breaking of seal six and the reassurance of revelation chapter seven is that christians have an inner security which is never affected by these external trials when i was at school i had to read the war poets and there was a uh, rupert brooke i think echoed this truth although i doubt very much if he really fully understood what he was writing safe shall be my going Secretly armed against all death's endeavour. Safe where all safety's lost. Safe where men fall. And if these poor limbs die, safest of all. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for your truth, for feeding us more and more. Do so that we may long for that day when we see Christ face to face and until that day reassure us by the sealing of your Holy Spirit that you will keep us by your power for the day of his glory. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. And now we close with a carol which really speaks of, in one part, of, of how in the midst of our weariness there is hope and joy. Alexa, resume. <laughs> 